It's now my pleasure to, well, not just yet, he's sitting next to me, but we won't talk to him just yet, um, to mention my first guest, who is the author of a book that, as he said earlier today in his talk, he just thought no one would read at all. But instead, of course, it sold 8 million copies. It's been translated into 40 languages and turned into a Hollywood film as well. So let's take a look at a clip from the film. My name is Liesl Memminger. I don't have a family or even a place to call home. I never understood the meaning of the word hope, but I'm about to meet the people who would change all that. Come. Meet your new parents. From now on, you call me mama, yeah? And that lazy pig over there, you call him papa. Your first book. Are you sure this is yours? It wasn't always mine. Can't you even read yet? Go on, read one word. I'm not such a good reader myself, you know. We will have to help each other out. I have something very important to tell you, Lisa. Who is he, Papa? His name is Max. He needs help. I need you to promise me that you will not tell anyone. Is that your book? It wasn't always mine. They're coming. They're checking basements. If anyone saw him, they would take you away from me. And they cannot tell you what they will do to him. There you go, Marcus Zuzak and a clip from The Book Thief. Let's make him welcome. Thank you. Uh, you just whispered to me during that, you just went, I haven't seen that for a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> clearly, have you watched it at all? Uh, the film? Yeah. or the? Uh, well, yeah, I saw it about six and a half times and uh, <laughs> one time I, I had to walk in a bit or I had, had to leave a bit early and uh, but I think yeah I've, I've seen it that many times but I think my mum and dad have seen it seven times Good so on uh, them. I won't be seeing it for a while. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. Um, today before in your TEDx talk I mean this is it's a, obviously it's a huge film the book has sold so many copies it's, it's rather massive so you, you, you're a guy who's experienced great success and yet you chose to talk about failure. Take me back to that decision. Why did you want to talk about that today? Well, it's just uh, representative of my sunny disposition. <laughs> and uh, and like, people often ask me why I, I chose death to narrate uh, a book, and I often say that as well. You know, it's just, it's just how I, I come across in a way. But no, I think failure has been really good to me. And and I, whenever I think like back to my childhood, I remember, I think it was from that moment when I threw three fouls in the, the, at the zone championships, which meant everything to me. My dad said to me that it's not, it's not the victories that'll define you, it's, uh, it's the defeats that make you stronger. And, and I think I've carried that with me my whole life, that, that everyone thinks that you're going to be happy because you're successful, but often people who are successful aren't that happy because you know, even today I came off the talk and everyone said, that was, that was great. And I was like, oh, I could have done this better <laughs> or I could have done that better. And, uh, and so you're immediately starting to work on the next one. And uh, I just can't help it, but that's kind of how I am. I mean, it doesn't sound like it's much fun to be me, but I kind of <laughs> like that. I take, uh, I remember talking to my publisher once and saying, what happens is I, I, I fall in love with something, as I have with writing, as I did with so many things over the years, and then I turn it into work. And that's when I really start enjoying it. Can you fall in love with failure? Usually quite a long time after the fact. <laughs> it's not that fun at the time, but then you look back and go, those were good days when I was eight years old, throwing the discus into the net. It's a lot better than being bagged on national television for your book, you know, where... And you've got to rem I think sometimes you get to a point where you remind yourself that the only reason I got that bad review or the only reason I was at that wedding where that woman who was a bit drunk kept telling me that she just couldn't get into my book. <laughs> and this was supposed to be in my talk. This is like ther therapy for you. Get it out now. Yeah, woman well, at a wedding. I went to a wedding and uh, this lady, you know when people have had a bit too much to drink, they tell you the same thing over and over again. And she said, oh, congratulations on your book. I just couldn't get into it. And the best part, she said, it wasn't like I didn't try either. I tried several <laughs> times. And the only reason that happens is because the book had done well. 
and that had gone into so many different, um, different pockets of the community. And, and so you're gonna, the, the door opens really wide and all these beautiful things come through, but of course bad things have to come through as well, and I'm mindful of that. Certainly. There's a question that's come in from John Rowley on Twitter. Uh, how should we go about changing the discussion around failure, given the prevalence of schadenfreude in our society? Marcus? Schadenfreude is one of the great words, isn't it? And it's the uh, one that we wish we had. <laughs> it, yeah, it's funny that schadenfreude, I've even, uh, with a friend of mine, she wrote to me saying schadenfreude, how great is that? And I was like, I think I suffer from self-schadenfreude, and uh, where you can even extend the word even further. I don't know, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question, and sometimes that's the best thing to say. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you want to come across as all intelligent, and uh, I've learned over the years that I should never try to be more intelligent than I am, in public at least. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm not sure, but I think... I think there is that idea of, you know, come on, like, pull yourself together and upward and onwards. And sometimes I think you've just got to be able to say, I know this is a really terrible moment. Let's even, let's wallow in it <laughs> for a few <laughs> minutes. Because, yeah, this is awful. And I think, and sometimes, you know, you, you lose a game. You, uh, you know, say you, the only thing you wanted to do was win your grand final or something or win the debate and you lose, you should be allowed to just go, you should be allowed to sit in the corner and cry because that's the first step to, to moving on and, and bringing the positive energy in because if you don't feel the defeat, oh, what's going to give you the motivation to not feel it again? Um, Marcus Zizak, there's a great question that's come from our audience. Lucy Carter's over there. You're looking mm -hmm. fabulous, Lucy. I think it's a little bit more about um, perhaps success than failure. Yeah. This is Eden. He's a university student and I'm guessing a bit of an aspiring writer. Eden, what's your question? Um, mine's a bit more about the creative writing process. Do you feel that you need to outline what's going to happen in the book entirely or do you prefer to write it one page at a time? Like, how exactly do you as a writer end up writing the book? Yep, there are two ways I do that. One is... First, I, I do see it in my head as a kind of, as a kind of race in a way and say, oh, say I was going to run 20 kilometres, which I would never, ever do. But um, <laughs> let's imagine that I could. And I always think of the drink stations. That's all I care about. In mar when I watch marathons, I always, I'm watching the drink stations. And, uh, and you want to run through as many checkpoints like that as you can. And they're your high points and your low points in the book that that bring the whole thing together and I want to run through all those checkpoints and often what you find is as you're writing it you still want to be flexible about those points because one that comes that you thought was in say part three of the book might end up in part seven and that's exactly what happened with the book thief for example there was a moment where a character gave a piece of bread to a man on the street that was always happening in part four but as I was writing I, I just kept it fluid enough that I could go, oh no, we can keep setting that back and setting it back. The way I then organise a book is I don't write chapter one, this, this and this will happen. I basically write chapter headings and uh, I do it over and over and over again and that's me just familiarising myself with the book and uh, I wish I could just write a book that was chapter headings and nothing else sometimes. <laughs> just uh, bullet points, that's, and we just oh, have yeah. to fill in the blanks, is that how it goes? <laughs> yeah, close passage. Yeah, and and that's, nice. a, that's a routine that you always do, regardless of what book you're writing, or even an article or something like that? I, I think it's... Uh, it, yeah, even like for the speech today, it, I pretty much... I had five things where I had the name of the town uh, and then where I showed up and no one came to hear me read from my book and then I had the next part which was the discus net and then I, and so on and yeah and that's exactly what I do there'll often be points within those points but I arrive at these chapter headings and I think what you want is you I want to wake up in the morning and feel the book near feel the world of the book near me and that's my way in often is okay let's let's remember the framework here so you could just fall asleep with your computer next to you as well literally near you yeah, yeah, okay, right, fair enough. Um, <laughs> the book is there, yeah. They're very close to your heart. Um, Stephen Stockwell's with us uh, too. He is on the mic, and hello, Stephen. You have another question from the TEDx Studio audience. I certainly do for now. I've got uh, Rachel over here who's got a question for Marcus. Hello. Um, hey. Just have to say, loved your book. Book Thank Thief you. is amazing. 
Um, I was really interested in your discussion about failure. Um, I work in sport and we're being told now that the movement is away from scoring children in younger ages of sport. And I was wondering how you felt about that. You know, you've learnt a lot from your failures. How are children going to learn now where they're not given the chance to fail at young ages? And yeah. learn with that process. That's, that's a really good question. And I, can, I, and I feel like I'm in at least a slightly unique position to answer that question because I agree with what you're saying, mostly. But I played in a football team in, from the under sixes to the under 11s, which didn't lose a game. And uh, it was terrifying driving to the ground every week, waiting for that first game that we would lose. <laughs> And then when we did lose, it was just like, it was like the world ended. But on the other hand, I still think that it was slightly... But I, I would probably look at... I think there's got to be a balance. So probably what I... I would look at that now and think it would have been great if somehow we got that... We organised things within that team so that things were different and so that we did lose a few games earlier on. <laughs> and so that we did... You know, because... You know, you know, we did need to f experience failure to realise that we could actually go home and live the rest of our lives having lost a game. And, uh, and so I think it goes both ways. I think there's got to be some common sense. And I do agree, and I agree with it in school as well, because there's got to be a point where someone says, you know, that's just not good enough. And, uh, and, and it can't... And I think there do need to be gradings, personally. And, uh, and a lot can be catered for different individuals mm. as well. So, um, so yeah, I, I agree with you, um, or what was intimated in the question, that, that we do need to win and lose. So you and need those early, early failures and yeah. early successes in order to, to build who you are, I suppose. Um, not all touchy-feely of, <laughs> oh, everyone's a winner. <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I don't think that really helps anyone. How, well, if that book was so successful, we've been talking about failure, is the next one coming along OK? Don't ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty bad silence, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, well, I'm in the throes of just reaching for that thing that's just always kind of out of reach. And, I, and it's not that fun when you're there, but you can only be grateful to it in the end because that is, like I said, that's what gives you the end result. And the example I can just give you now is, and it's not even a brilliant idea, but I'd structured this book in seven parts. And... Often, I think, like, I just got the idea that the first part is called cities, the second part was going to be called waters, and the third part, criminals. And, uh, and then I thought, oh, what if part two was actually cities plus waters? And then part three was cities plus waters plus criminals. And it's not a brilliant idea, but it suits the book. And had it all gone smoothly, it w I wouldn't have got that idea. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure to have Marcus Zizak with us here in the studio. A round of applause for Marcus Zizak. Thank you. Thanks, Janela. Thank you.